Hi, welcome back. This is part four of a series where I am constructing a protogen head and programming it in TinyGo. I've made a lot of progress in the three weeks since the last update, even though a lot of that I was on vacation. Uh, I did take most of the stuff with me on that trip and spent the better part of a day uh, hacking around at it with a friend who had a little bit more knowledge on how some of the stuff works than I did. Uh, I'll go into more detail on that later. Um, and have spent some more time writing code and doing some further updates uh, since then. But now that all the travel's done, I am uh, ready to start diving back into this in earnest. So at the end of part three, I had uh, mentioned that I was having some problems with the Teensy 4.1 with uh, TinyGo and was going to give up on it and switch to the um, matrix portal from Adafruit. And that has arrived. I did put a short up just a few minutes ago about uh, how that worked out. It didn't quite work as I thought it would, but in the end I was able to make it work quite well. So I'm going to be sticking with that for now. Um, it is a somewhat slower processor, but it is still very extensive with what it can do. Uh, I am using it in this form factor because it has a nice connector on it. Uh, that I'm going to be using, even though I'm not going to be using it in the way originally intended by Adafruit. Uh, the, this thing was designed to just plug into the back of uh, one of these uh, LED boards and just stick off the side and drive it directly uh, with all of the different lines that these things need directly driven by the board. I'm not doing it that way. Turns out that doesn't perform quite well enough, at least in TinyGo, or at least I couldn't figure out how to make it actually run at a reasonable frame rate and not take the entire processor time to do it. So what I'm going to do is a method that a lot of people have been using uh, on all sorts of different processors to effectively get a free way to do this, and that's to chain all of the outputs so I'm going to be doing it in such a way that uh, some other people have been doing to kind of cheat and be able to use a spy driver to do this. And the way that you do that is these things have six different data pins on them for two different sets of red, green, and blue. And they're effectively shift registers. You shift in a value for a specific pixel along the screen. So. There's 32 lines, there's four address lines, which gives you 16, and then the, the two sets of data lines are the top half and the bottom half, effectively. And then there's also a clock line to send it through and a latch line to say this is what we actually want to do. And then there's the output enable line that actually turns them on. So all those are driven independently. The cheaty way to do it with SPY is you can construct something in memory where it's a, a, the bit plane of everything and you can just send some of the red, then the other red, then the green, then the other green, then the blue, and the other blue, and you have to wire them up. This was the part that I just couldn't understand for the longest time, is that you have to wire up the output uh, port of the last panel back into the input port of the first panel to send them down to the next color once they reach the end. So you're turning six parallel shift registers into one really big shift register. So it takes longer to send the data out to it, which limits your uh, update time, but in practice that really doesn't matter because you can send the data quickly enough and it's still uh, fast enough that persistence of vision makes it look really good. So this similar kind of hookup here is you have to take the, the output for red one and hook it to the input for red two, or output for red two and the input for green one, and so on and so forth. So I was doing that manually with a bunch of jumper wires for a while, and it worked. It was just a major pain in the ass to hook it up once, whenever I moved it, and it was fraught with hooking stuff up backwards. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna to need to make a custom PCB at some point. But before I get to that point, I'm using one of those little perma proto boards that I got for, uh, for free from the amount of money that I've been spending on my Adafruit orders and just wired that up with uh, pin headers to hook into the board, pin headers to hook into the display, and pin headers to hook in from the return from the, the last uh, screen here. So you can see I just have jumper wires going from there up to here and there's a, a rat's nest of wires on here hooking these all up and this works quite nicely. 
and everything is nice and stable and there's no loose wires and I can much more quickly hook stuff up if I have to take it apart. The only annoying thing is getting these six uh, wires back onto this connector correctly and on the other end. But that's very minor. So I'd gotten to the point where that worked, but I was using just the plain old regular spy driver on this board, which doesn't use DMA or anything. So you tell it to send something and that's all that the processor is doing until it's done. So you're kind of, you're limited in the amount of other stuff that you can be doing at the same time, which is really limiting to the color depth that you can display because you, you can't really display everything at that point. Uh, you, you, you don't have the, the processor speed to be able to display 8-bit color or 24-bit color, 8 bits per channel. So that, that was a problem. Uh, I don't actually have that code anymore uh, to demonstrate. But uh, when I hung out with my friend a couple weeks ago, we had experience hooking up DMA for stuff on this exact processor, which is a SAMD51. So we just sat down. Uh, I had found a driver for TinyGo that was for the that worked with the same D51, but it only supported a specific SIRCOM, which is like the serial communications port. There's several of those on here, and they can all do UART, SPY, and I2, I2C. squared But that particular driver was hard coded that it had to be SIRCOM one. Uh, I was able to get it to work. SIRCOM one, coincidentally, is available on the TX and RX pins on the main. Uh, pin block here. So I, I hooked it up to that, hacked the code a little bit because that's different pins than the normal pins for SIRCOM1, but it still worked. Got it to function. Hooray, it was great. Uh, when I was hanging out with my friend, we're like, well, what else can we do to improve this? Can we use this connector that's already here? Obviously, we can't plug it straight into the display, but that certainly makes it nicer for plugging into something else if we can get everything that we need going through this connector. We poked around at it a little bit. We, we found a bug in the pinout, coincidentally, from Adafruit. Uh, address B and address E here are backwards. And these, they should be swapped. This, the bottom address E is correct, but the top address E should be on pin 8, not pin 12. But anyway, that, we found that problem with this pinout. Uh, I had gotten it working with SIRCOM1 over here on these two TX and RX pins, but we wanted to simplify the wiring. So we, we figured out a way that we could use uh, SIRCOM4, here we go, over here, the, the purple SIRCOM4 on uh, pin 11 and 12. Uh, so we figured out how to get that to work. Had it wired up, was working, and we just basically went straight down here for the different address lines and other such stuff. Um, so this pinout is absolutely not what we're using anymore, but it helped us find that there was another circom we could use. This is the, the short version of it. So got that all worked with the, the hodgepodge direct wiring and worked great. It's like, hooray, progress. I got home from my trip and was fed up with hooking this all up, so I made the little proto board here to uh, make the wiring job significantly easier. Took me, I don't know, an hour or two of soldering to get it all in there, but it works great. I'll turn this on here in a few minutes so you can see it. But at that point, I'm like, cool, I can start moving on to a couple other parts of the hardware. Um, I still don't have any support for buttons yet. That's probably the next important thing. Oh, I'm skipping ahead. So, that, so that's the, the display sorted. So it's, it's using DMA for spy. So I just say, set, display this on the screen, tell it to, and it just goes, and the CPU can go do other stuff. Either wait for the next frame if it's too early, or realistically, start drawing the next frame is probably what it's going to be most of the time. Because this, this CPU is only 120 megahertz. It doesn't have quite the oomph to... Uh, draw this at 60 hertz uh, with with the entire screen changing so after that we're like okay what else can we try to optimize here because it was still running very uh, kind of slow at that point because it was also having to update the little oled display that we're going to be i'm going to be using for the internal menu display so, or status display so the user can see it so i had to so, so we're like okay 
this isn't quite fast enough. What can we do to improve it? We're like, well, can we try to DMA the I, I squared C? So we started hacking at that, and that actually worked quite easily. Um, a lot of this code is still very hacky. I need to clean it up, but it works. Updating the screen, the inside screen, we only have to spend the time to update the, the frame buffer. Same as the external screens. It still takes a good amount of time, but it's a lot faster with the DMA. I had to make a change to my little text library to try to optimize it to not have to redraw the entire frame buffer to only draw lines that have changed. So that helped. And at that point, I'm like, okay, the displays are pretty good. We're not, we're, we're at an acceptable frame rate. It's not amazing, but it's acceptable. So it's time to worry about more about the software, worry more about the last little bits of input or hardware like the buttons to control the menu and settings um, and eventually the boop sensor, maybe the microphone to try to animate the mouth. So I'm, I'm, I'm at that point where it's the big stuff's done, let's sort out the little stuff and then let's go dive in on the software. So I've been talking enough, let's turn it on so you can see exactly what the current state is. Um, t takes a while to boot. I'll go into why later and yes, I'm a fucking nerd. That's a re recreation of the 3D hourglass from what, Windows 95, Windows 98. Anyway, once it's booting, it just scrolls uh, the sticker across the screen for, um, to, to basically performance benchmark. This animation of the sticker here is updating every pixel on the face screens every frame. Obviously a lot of them are black or off, but it has to go through and redraw every pixel every frame. So that is a good way to benchmark how much time it's going to take to do that. And on the other display, the OLED display, um, you can see that there's a bit more long messages there. I'll reset it here in a moment. And go so that we can see the entire boot process. But at the bottom we have an actually correct clock updating every second now and we have a frame rate counter which is, as far as I'm aware, accurate. So currently it is able to anim animate the screen at about 44 frames per second, which isn't great, but it's, ex it, it's not bad. It's, it's acceptable. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the reset button on this board so we can see the entire boot process. So you can see it's, it's connecting to Wi-Fi now. It's using the, the Wi-Fi coprocessor. It's connecting my, my uh, Internet of Things Wi-Fi network. It connected, it got an IP address, it performed an NTP uh, time request, and it got the, the current time from an NTP server. And it took nine seconds to do all that. So during that process is when it puts the hourglass on the screen because it's still loading everything, it's still booting. But once that's done, we have an accurate clock and it can just run freely. Um, also, last night I was messing around with button input and there's an up and a down button on here. I don't know how I'm gonna use them long term, but it helps for right now. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, the second to bottom line on the screen, if I press a button, it says that I press, what button I press. It stays there even when I let go of it. That's just me being lazy in the code. Ooh, what happened there? I actually don't know what happened there. Something got out of sync. It's amazingly still working. It's just rotated. It shouldn't, I don't know what happened there. I've never seen that happen before. Something glitchy with the I squared C, I imagine. Oh, the NeoPixel's on again, go away. So clearly something funky happened there. Uh, that, that light's supposed to get turned off. So yeah, live demos. That hasn't happened before. That's the current status of the hardware and software. There's still a lot of work to do. I have to figure out where to put other buttons because I need more buttons the way I'm envisioning it. So I can put them on the breadboard for now or maybe even put some of them on this little proto board or I have more proto boards I could maybe use. I'll probably just start with a breadboard because I have several of those. I made a helper little driver for the screen here. So instead of having to manually mirror everything like this, there's a, a separate mirror driver. 
So instead of it being a, a 128 by 32 display, as far as the code's concerned, it's just a 64 by 32 display. And when I write to a specific pixel on here, it automatically puts it on the same pixel just mirrored around a vertical line in the center of the physical displays. So the code is simpler for that. Obviously that means everything is going to be mirrored. Uh, I might make a way to bypass that later if I ever need to. But for now, it shall suffice. The next big things are going to be figuring out the buttons, uh, maybe figuring out the boop sensor and the microphone next, and restructuring this code, because there's a lot of hacks going on in this code right now. Um, I'm already starting to restructure some of the code to, to make it make a little more sense and be easier going back and forth to the simulator, which still works and is a lot easier to test stuff with. In fact, I can go ahead and open the simulator. Okay, so I have the simulator code here. I haven't run on this computer in a while and I actually had a compile error because I changed something since last time I ran the simulator. Oh good, it just fires up and then I don't see anything on the screen. What the heck? Okay, clearly running this at a high frame rate on Linux doesn't work. Oh god, I can't even close it. Okay, I haven't had a problem running this on Windows. This is clearly a Linux problem. Let's try a lower frame rate. Nope. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not showing the simulator right now. That's, again, live demos. Okay. Whatever. I might just even come t entirely cut that from the, uh, the video. This, the, the main loop code still needs a lot of uh, cleanup, but it gets the job done for now. Oh uh, yeah, um, some of the, the hacky stuff that needs to happen to make this work um, is somewhere. So some of the hacky stuff like this, I'm using a completely hacked up version of the OLED display driver to get DMA into it. And it's reaching into the driver I'm using for these displays to set up the DMA because I had to hack that up a lot as well to work on, on this particular board. So I need to clean up the DMA code for sure. Not 100% sure how I'm gonna do that in a way that could be, I would like it to be able to be merged into upstream on TinyGo drivers. It's incredibly unlikely, but I just at least need to make this cleaner so it's not terrible. That's the current state. I can also show one other thing that I was doing is I have, oops. Some code in here for showing a mirror of the external display on the internal display. So I'm not going to be doing it like this long term because it is very slow and shows more stuff than it needs to. But, so I have code in here that basically down, basically just down samples the red channel. If it's above a certain value, it's on. If it's below it, it's off. And it completely ignores blue and green. So once it's done booting here, it's gonna, we're going to lose the top half of the log and it's just going to show the animation. But it's a proof of concept that this will work. It, you can notice it's only running at 29 FPS now instead of 44. So it does take a significant it does take a not insignificant amount of CPU time to just update the frame buffer, even though we are sending this out over I squared C via DMA. Another thing is I need to probably hook this up to a different I squared C bus because I need to be able to use I squared C for other stuff. And if you're DMAing some, but not everything, then that can get very difficult to keep things synchronized. So you're not like trying to do multiple things at the same time with the bus. So if I use different buses, that'd make it easier. So when I get down to actually designing a circuit board, which is probably going to be before too much longer, this, this is going along well. I've kind of been rambling because I'm trying to remember what I've done over the last three weeks. But this is the current status. Um, I'm, tr I'm going to try to get back to weekly cadence on these videos, probably every weekend. Uh, at some point, I would like to actually do some screen recording while I'm working on code so I can t try to talk through some actual code working instead of having to go demonstrate it uh, after the fact. Probably once I'm done with all of the current cleanup effort, I will do that. And once I get to designing the PCB, I'll probably record some of that and put some of that into a video. And yeah, 
it's 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 coming along well. Um, I have not heard any sort of update on the head frame. It's been what about a month and a half since I ordered that, mm, five or six weeks. Maybe I'll have it by the end of the year. Maybe it'll take a couple more months than that. I don't know. I just want to have as much stuff ready to go before it gets here as I can. But that's that's all I really had right now. Um, hopefully this video won't be too long or rambly. But if you're if you're enjoying this series, please subscribe, comment, hit the like button. Just let me know that I'm you know not just talking to the void. Oh, and I completely forgot to mention until just now is I did pick up a uh, lavier mic that's plugged into my camera now. I did a quick little test and it didn't sound that great on the camera's speaker compared to the camera's microphone. So hopefully it does actually sound better and I didn't just waste an entire half an hour recording this. If it isn't that much better than the other mic, I might just go back to the camera's mic. I might buy a more expensive microphone. This was like 50 bucks, so it's not super cheap, but it's also it, it, it's not super high end, but it's also not like cheap. So hopefully it actually worked well, but that's what I have here. Thanks for watching.